recording starts now. And um, Claire is just going to take the first five minutes of um, today's session just to introduce a program that the, the Girls in Tech South Africa will be running and extend the invitation to all of you. So Claire, take it away. Great. Thanks, Lauren. I'm just going to share a screen. So one of the initiatives that we have at Girls in Tech is um, we last year we hosted our first successful mentorship and menteeship um, program. And we're going to kick another one off for the year. So I thought it would be uh, the WIT group would be a really great group just to sort of touch base with um, and, and maybe consider yourself as being a mentor. Um, it's a 12 week program um, and each week we kind of give you an outline around what we cover and we give you content. But really, it's also about what works for you and what works for the mentee. Um, also, if you know of ladies who are interested in, in the tech world and, and just need a bit of menteeship, um, please send them our way. So we're busy with all the adverts and, and pulling everyone in um, on social media. So hopefully from next week, you'll start seeing on social media the Girls in Tech mentor menteeship applications. Um, we'll also email them out to everyone in the WIT group. So if you are interested, um, please apply. Or if you're interested in finding out more before you apply, let us know. Um, but yeah, we're hoping to really have a successful mentorship program. Um, the dates are all there that, we, that we're kind of aiming for. Um, yeah, and it would be great to have um, girls in tech and women in tech working together on this. So let me know if you're interested. Thanks, Lauren. Lauren, you're on mute. Hello, you're on mute. I turned it off so you didn't hear me clicking. Um, this type of mentoring program is exactly what um, we try and drive with our with Network South Africa. It's one of our three pillars, networking, leadership, and getting more women and girls into the technology space. So really, I encourage you to get involved. Um, Claire, if you can just share that slide into our chat, please. Sure. And um, and perhaps just drop your email address in there as well, please, so that people can contact you directly if they are keen. Um, okay, so ladies, first up, our first speaker this afternoon actually needs no introduction. She is a um, long time, I'm sure one of our first um, within the first year that we introduced WIT um, in the uh, middle of 2016, I think Vanessa got involved. Um, everybody knows Vanessa as Van, so Vanessa Rath. Um, if you have not yet, I encourage you to go onto her website. It's a gorgeous website, but her landing page just um, has a photo of Vanessa that sums up exactly who she is. And you can, if you, if you, um, if you haven't yet met her, you can already feel the energy coming off her. And I think the thing that I love most about Vanessa is that she is such an awesome person to approach to speak at WIT events because one, it's a great energy to get the year going. And two, she's so passionate about what she does. Um, you know, she um, her business is called The Talent Hunter. And it really just speaks to the kind of profile that she is in terms of getting to know people and looking for um, the best in people. And all of us who've ever worked with Van or been trained by Van know that her energy and her passion really is just something to behold. Um, and it's a fantastic way for us um, to kick off the year. And so I just um, I, uh, last or two weeks ago when I asked Van if she would speak today, I said, you know, one of the biggest things that people have reached out to me about is um, obviously the job network and um, uh, the economy is very, very stressed at the moment. And it's there's such a fine, fine line between success and failure when um, applying for a new job or, or promoting and moving upwards in your organization or changing career direction. And I get asked that question a lot, as do I'm sure a lot of the people on this call who are also in HR. Um, you know, how can I differentiate myself? How can I make myself stand out? And there's certainly only one person that I would go to to answer that question. So Van, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Take it away. 
Awesome. Jeez, Lo, what, what an intro there. Um, I'm glad it's recorded because if I'm ever feeling a little bit down or mopey, I'm just going to re-listen to that. So first of all, shout out to everyone who's here. I recognize a lot of people, um, a lot of people that I've worked with, a lot of people that I've recruited, and it's just really great to see everyone again. So thank you so much. I just want to double check everyone can see my screen. Uh, I'm a Zoom local, not really a Teams local, so I just want to yes. confirm. We Thanks, Lo. Thanks. Thanks, man. Thank you. So guys, I'm going to start on a positive note because look, it's last all about positivity and the market has picked up unbelievably in 2021. Um, I obviously deal with a lot of recruiters, but I've especially been talking to recruiters for the last two or three weeks because I'm presenting to um, Henley Business School tomorrow and I actually just needed to get a snapshot of what's happening in the South African job market. And what we see happening is agency recruiters, internal recruiting teams, all of these people are so busy. Everyone is stretched. They're looking for talent. And what's going to happen, I believe, is that the marketplace is going to become even more crowded. So when Law reached out to me and she she said to me that, um, you know, would I present? And I heard Paula was presenting. I first of all said, well, Paula needs to take the main stage because she's unbelievable at what she does. Uh, I just want a bit of time. So I'm going to spend 25 minutes with you today just talking about how you're going to be standing out in this crowded marketplace. So please feel free to ask questions. I am monitoring the chat. I can multitask. I'm a lady. Um, I'm drinking water, though, because I haven't made it to a, a bottle store yet. I even got a brand new phone delivered on Monday that I haven't even taken out of the box, the new Samsung S21. So I'm dying to get onto it, but I've been really, really busy. So, guys, let's... Uh, Without any further ado, I hope you've all picked up my contact details from the slide. In case you need anything afterwards, please feel free to, to reach out to me. So a little bit about me, because I know that I don't know everyone on the call. So who am I? I'm a global sourcing trainer and sourcing specialist. That, for me, was one of the, the absolute silver linings of... Um, uh, of COVID, that people realize it doesn't matter where your trainer is. It doesn't matter that your um, trainer is working every day in a pair of pluckies or slops, which I'm quite happy to share with you. And my business went global very quickly, which was amazing. I also am a specialist sourcer and I specialize in mainly tech talent and moving tech talent around the globe. I'm also passionate about personal branding. And the reason why I'm so passionate about personal branding is that I launched my own business uh, two years ago on the 1st of April, as one does. And I am very fortunate because I'm probably the world's worst cold caller because I just get all jittery and stumble over my words. And I haven't had to cold call for any business. Um, how I've grown my business is all through um, using social media, completely free platform, and just by kind of getting in people's faces in a nice way, staying top of mind, and just regularly posting on these platforms. And that's why I, I, hopefully Lauren asked me to talk today to impart some of my words of wisdom to you. Now, if one thing COVID taught us is that we all need a side hustles. So my side hustles, is I do a lot of keynote speaking, um, which I really enjoy. I am missing the travel to all of these lovely uh, locations, but you know, presenting from my third bedroom in four ways is just gonna have to do for now. And my other side hustle is wildlife photography. These are some of my photos. I absolutely love getting out of Joburg, spending some time in the bush and working on my photography. So good to meet you all. And uh, again, if you've got any questions, speak up. I'm here to help you. So let's quickly start with a definition around our brand. And this is a, a brand, uh, you know, this is talking about your personal brand, but also remember everything that I'm saying talks to employer brand and employer brand for talent attraction purposes is becoming really important these days too. So we all know Jeff Bezos, so I'm sure that we all wish we had a chunk of his bank accounts. But he said, and he's actually famously quoted for this in several places, is that your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. And it's really important that you, what people are saying about you is positive. Because more and more these days, we're not really meeting in person. Look at us. We're 50 women. We're meeting on an online platform. Did any of you go and Google the speakers before you joined this meeting today? That is where we're meeting people. It's all going online. It's all going digital. So what I encourage you to do is I want you to just do what we call a social media audit. And when you get off the call or tomorrow or something, I want you to actually go and Google yourself. Because you want your personal brand to be what you put out there. You don't want 
the internet to determine what your personal brand is, which actually happens to a lot of people. So I really encourage you to Google you and see what peop other people are saying about you, or you can go and see what you've put out over the last couple of years. Because remember, what we put on the internet never disappears. So my presentation today, it's all about the what, the how, and the why around your brand. And um, hopefully there'll be lots of takeaways. Again, you've got my website, you've got my, um, my uh, LinkedIn URL, reach out to me um, if you have any questions too. So I've identified six reasons why we need an outstanding online brand. So just like, I don't know if any of you have bought any new appliances of late, you've gone on holiday, probably a local holiday, you've maybe purchased a new car. How many of you did that before doing research online? And I'm sure not many of you. And that's exactly what is happening with people at the moment. People are going to research you before you even walk in a door. And we just assume that people are going to research us on one platform, and that's LinkedIn. But unfortunately not. Not everyone's on LinkedIn, contrary to popular belief. It could be Facebook, because that's their preferred platform, or mainly because they want to see if there's any mutual connections. Or they're just going to Google you. And I would rather get ahead of that and know what is being said about me out there or what my profiles look like to other people. But what we need to remember is that a lot of people talk about social media as a dark and dangerous place and something that you know, we shouldn't be using from a professional um, career perspective. But actually, I just want to talk to how it is just an amazingly powerful tool that if you use it correctly, is really going to work in your favor. So let's have a look at why we need the online brand. Basically, is you want to be standing out as a thought leader. As mentioned before, there's a crowded marketplace these days. How are you going to stand out? It's not good enough these days just to have a brilliantly written CV, maybe put together by someone who does this for, for their job, they're a CV writer, but it's how you portray yourself online because people are going to look beyond the CV. So if you were to look at your LinkedIn profile and you were to be really critical, is would you say that you are standing out from your peers? And it's so simple to do that. All you need to do is to start sharing more on these platforms. Instead, what happens a lot, especially in the South African context, is that people join these platforms and they forget that it's actually just like having a conversation in person. Even more now that we're all working from home during the times of a uh, time of the pandemic. So we need to actually start sharing, building a community, growing a network around us. It's not good enough just to have a profile on there these days. You want to share. And by sharing, you get elevated to that thought leader kind of position. Another reason is that it's going to inspire trust. And I always talk about where you're going to be cross-referenced. And you never know where you are going to be cross-referenced, which is why you kind of need to get your house in order when it comes to your digital footprint. And you, don't, you can't say they're not going to check me out on Facebook because I don't check anyone else out on Facebook. That doesn't mean that other people can't be looking at you. And it's a free, open, public platform. On the flip side of this, I was actually a guest on a podcast on Monday, and I, and I actually had a disagreement with the presenter of the podcast. So I don't know if the podcast is even going to air. But she said, she was telling the audience, what I always tell people when I do coaching with them is that they must lock down their privacy settings. And I was like, whoa, hold the bus with this. Because... When people who are looking to grow their teams, so either internal recruiters, agency recruiters, hiring managers, CEOs, see people with their privacies locked down, they begin to think, what has this person got to hide? So we've got to think about it. Is it better to lock down all of your privacy or is it actually better just to be a little bit cleverer around what you share and start realizing that these tools are awesome tools for you to advance your career? So by having a strong online presence, you're building trust because you can see that the people who have got um, lots of interactions, lots of posts, lots of recommendations have that kind of trusted status already, which is pretty much 50% of your battle done. Also, it's going to make you more memorable. So say, for example, we need to start recruiting and we're looking for someone who is in the data science space. I actually want the person who is at the top of their game um, from a data science perspective. Just to be honest with you guys, job boards, waste of time. I haven't recruited off a job board for five years. I really don't want someone who's got time in their lives to load their CV onto a job board. 
I would rather look at someone who's really shooting the lights out on LinkedIn, who's encouraging conversation, who's got community around them, and who's really standing out by the activities on the platform. So I want the person who's standing on stage presenting at Datacom. I want the person who's constantly posting about data science. I want the person who's running a community on Meetup in the data science space. Because with that person into my organization is going to come the community and it's going to come the network. And that is why you need to be memorable and why you need to stand out on these platforms. Also, if you have a great online brand, it's a lot easier to sell yourself. So I've been told a lot of times when people reach out to me, and I'm just being honest here, is they say, Vanessa, you've just posted a picture on LinkedIn and you've actually just uh, trained the client that I am recruiting for. So if their internal talent acquisition recruiters are better at recruiting than my team, I've got a problem. When can we book you for training? So by what I'm sharing is that I'm actually selling things, but I'm not actually being salesy because there's nothing worse. You know it, you've seen people on LinkedIn. As soon as you connect with them, I must admit financial advisors are the worst with this. They come straight in with that sales pitch. You don't want to be that person. Building an online personal brand is all about giving back. And I encourage you to work out some kind of a ratio. My ratio at the moment is six to one. So I give out six posts where I'm helping people. Maybe I'm giving advice about CVs, how to interview, mentioning a, a conference coming up for free that people can join. And then on my eighth post, it's the ask. And that would be something along the lines of help. I need assistance. I'm looking for X, Y, and Z. Do you know anyone in your network that you can recommend to me? And we need to realize that social media has been abused in, really badly in this manner for a long time. And we need to actually start creating that online presence by actually giving more than, ex than what we ex um, expect in return. And second to last, in order to start a great online brand, you're going to need to dig deep and define your why. And we're going to get onto that because there is something unique that stands out for everyone at what you do. And it doesn't mean that you have this ridiculous extrovert, high energy personality that I have, because this really hasn't held me in very good stead all the time. And I'll give you an example. I've presented at Microsoft events now for probably 12, 13 years. So your SQL Saturdays, the SharePoint Saturdays. And um, what often happens is I'm approached after the um, presentations that I, that, that I give by some people, but some people I know that they're there, they're a little bit shyer. One guy, it took five years for him to come and speak to me. And he spoke to me because we'd actually been sitting in a group at lunchtime and just having a general chat. And he said to me, Vanessa, your personality is quite intimidating and I have been nervous to approach you, but I've always sat in your presentations because I enjoy the value that you give, but I never realized we could actually have a friendship around this because, excuse me, because um, I didn't know, you know, I'm such an introvert, you made me nervous. So what I'm saying is, be yourself, find what people call your USP, your unique selling point, and run with it. It is going to attract people from different kind of aspects of um, the population. And we need to remember that not everyone's going to get on with everyone. But if you can keep it quite neutral, calm it down, tame it down, you're probably going to be able to connect with a large number of people. And finally, the best thing about having a strong online brand, and this has happened to me, is that you can build relationships with anyone. And it doesn't even have to be people that you have met. So for the last year, I've actually been partnering with a gentleman in um, Budapest in Hungary. We've been selling diversity sourcing workshops. I've never met the guy. We both are just passionate about diversity from different angles, and we're both passionate about sourcing. So it just shows you that collaborations, work, um, people approach me for training, I've never met them, you develop friendships, you become friends, all of that can actually happen online. And I can't believe that I'm saying that. And those of you who know me will probably be thinking the same thing. So let's move on to the how quickly. How are we going to build the strong online brand? So the first step, and this is what I really, really encourage people to do, and this probably is what kind of took me almost too long to do before I went and I launched my own business because I'm loving being a solopreneur, is that you have to lay a foundation that you can confidently and authentically build upon. I don't know if any of you saw last week on LinkedIn, I actually put a post together and I said, 
I'm presenting at a woman in tech group um, next week around your personal brand. The one thing, so I must have got about, I don't know, 25 comments on the post. The one thing that rang true from the post was everyone said, building an, to, in order to build an online brand, you need to be authentic and you need to be genuine and you need to be yourself. So if you take anything from this presentation that I'm doing, take that away because that is what came out as a resounding must be included. So I love this quote too. You want to find the special thing that is you and make your brand all about that. You can't make it up. It has to be real, though it can and probably should be a little exaggerated. And I just love that because it's so real, isn't it? So the thing about me is all about sourcing. It's all about finding talent. Um, if you are struggling with this, speak to those closest to you. That's what I ended up doing. And I actually said, what is the unique? And it's not the unique business proposition. It's what makes you unique. What part of your personality and the whole you do you want to start applying into your personal brand? So mine is the topic is always, or the subject, should I say, is always around sourcing. But my underlying thing is positivity. I will never, ever post anything negative. I will always turn a negative into a positive. And if it was a negative experience, if anyone saw my day, what it was like on Monday when I had the blue screen of death on my laptop and I was starting to be training in, a, in an hour's time, turn it into a positive. I turned that LinkedIn post as a reminder to people to back up to OneDrive because if I hadn't have done that, my entire training would have fallen flat. La, thanks for that uh, quote. Love it. Love Dr. Zeus. So what you need to do is that what we're all about at the moment is storytelling and sharing. And I encourage you to share your story with your audience because all of the posts that perform the best on LinkedIn are not the posts that I share that someone else has written. It's things that have happened to me. So again, back to that post on Monday when my laptop had crashed, my Wi-Fi at home had died. I've since found out something about Mercury and retrograde. My Garmin watch isn't working at the moment. So yeah, it's all just going pear-shaped from a tech perspective this week in my life. But you don't need to post about how dismal life is and how bleak you are about that. Sure, I'm just going to drink a lot of wine to get through that, but I'm not going to be posting about that either. So it's all about what you are going to be sharing and how you're going to be sharing your story. I also encourage people to build credibility by positioning yourself alongside others who stand out in the market. And this could be people from a global perspective or it could be people from a local perspective or even from a South African perspective. You know, if you really admire someone or you have someone that you look up to, start connecting with them. It's just so much easier online these days. And start feeding off them, bouncing ideas off them, you know, meeting with them. As soon as you meet with them, be posting some photos about it. And what happens is that your online brand is going to grow by association. You don't have to be weird and creepy about it, but it's just something that is going to be happening over time. So, two very important points here. So what you need to think about is what you do. And this is not if you're looking, you know, potentially for another job. This is just if you're quite happy with where you are in life at the moment. But think about what do you do? Because you probably do several things at the moment. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to come up with what is your value proposition or that unique selling point. So what is the value that you either provide to your clients or to your business? Because that is what we need to focus on. A lot of people cannot give an, ele an elevator pitch of five sentences of what you do because we actually do too much. And then again, how do you do it? So we have to think about what we do every day, our process, our product, our service, a unique name. And this is where a lot of people get stuck, is coming up with putting a name to what you do. But what I always encourage people to do from a personal branding perspective is, even though you probably do quite a few things, choose one, Choose one that you enjoy the most and push that onto your personal brand and onto your platforms because that's what you're going to be remembered by. Okay, so also, as, as Lauren said, is that I've probably been one of the longest standing members of this group, not only because I just really enjoy everyone who's here. I used to get free wine, but I don't get free wine anymore, so I'm just going to complain to management about that. Um, but it's really a good bunch of people. So people know if they want to find me or they want to chat with me, I'm pretty much going to be at every wit, wit meeting that I can make. But also what I've done is I've created communities. 
So on Facebook, I've created a community of sources in South Africa. So I realize not everyone is on that group, but people know where to find me. I make it easy for people to find me. And I think that being approachable, being easy to find, no, I'm not inundated with weird requests or things that I can't help with. I'm a firm believer in karma in life. And if people can find me and I can insist them, I know that they're going to pay it forward when they get the opportunity to do so. Also, you need to start looking at your target audience, like you're growing a personal brand. That's awesome. But why? Do you want to be well known in the tech industry? Do you want to be well known for helping charities or NGOs? What kind of a legacy do you want to leave? And start focusing in that sort of an area, because that's that's also really important. Unfortunately, we can't be all things to everyone. And guys, I did this. I know I'm probably not looking my strongest um, at the moment, but it's been a, a busy day or looking my best. I actually took the plunge and I went for professional um, photographs. Uh, towards the end of last year, I decided the time is now. And I cannot tell you the positive impact that that has had. I had a lot of people, conference presenters, telling me that the photo that I was using was, um, it wasn't high res enough, I wasn't looking at the camera, it wasn't a head and shoulder shot. But just by getting a decent photograph, that's probably not a selfie, and writing a good bio is just a step in the right direction just to start working on that personal brand of yours. Also, Guys, remember, it's about sharing. It's about giving. So what you need to do is once you've chosen your industry, you've chosen your target audience, and it doesn't matter if you've got one or two people from other kind of industries joining in, share. Share, share, and share some more. Because sharing these days is literally the currency in order to grow your status in society. Before, what was happening was that... Um, Sorry, I just got a bad network quality. Um, what was happening before is that people were keeping all information to themselves, but now it's actually the people who are sharing who are actually the ones who are standing out. And that's what we want to be doing. Also, I encourage you to join groups. So the wonderful that you hear sitting in the, in the WIT group and also volunteer a lot in order to help others. And do it because you want to. Don't do it because you're doing it for social media and you want to have those photographs put on a platform. People who give get a lot more in return. And that is something that we need to remember. And coming to the end of this, I'm nearly done. I want you to find an expert that you admire, follow them on all of their platforms, get to know them, set up a call with them. As I say, it's so much easier to set up a call with people these days and try and not replicate their behavior because I don't believe that it's good to copy someone who's your own person. Remember, be authentic and genuine. But share their content, you know, comment on their content, be associated with them. So, guys, that is it from me. I um, There's my contact details. Please go look at my new website. I've actually just uh, put out a new website in January. I thank you for your time. Um, I hope that you learned something. And if you need anything more, there are my details. You know how to get hold of me. So, guys, it's a pleasure. I wish everyone a really awesome 2021. And hopefully before the end of the year, we can actually catch up in person and drink wine. That would be fantastic, Van. Um, thank you very much. Hugely insightful. I've, I've taken a lot of notes. And there's, I have um, two questions for you. And perhaps some of the other ladies on the call will have questions. Um, I, um, I want to go back to the comment you made around privacy settings and our fear around that. As you know, that was one of my biggest concerns, um, you know, in terms of having a high privacy settings and being quite fearful about the information that's out there. Um, can you just maybe give a little bit more insight into what you mean around this and, and why you're promoting um, not not a lack of privacy, but more just maybe go a little bit into detail as we discussed last year around, well, actually the year before, and um, last year. I don't know where we are now. I think, I think it was last year. Lord, yeah, this is a very simple one, and we can answer it very simply. Think to all of the sessions that you've done online. How many of you, for the first time, have met the people who work with you, your colleagues, partners? You've seen their children. You've seen the dog. I mean, I train with my cat sitting over my shoulder most days. So what is happening is that we're getting to know each other a lot more being online. 
So people are now used to seeing things about you online. And law, I mean, and we all know you've got Leo, you've got a beautiful little boy. And I understand if you don't want to be sharing photos of your children on, on online. But guys, there's ways around that. Go to your Facebook, check out your friends. You can segment them into family, school friends, varsity friends. And when you post those pictures of your kids that you don't want everyone to see, let them just see those photographs. Okay? So there are ways around it, but people don't realize is that when they lock them down, the immediate thought is, what is this person trying to hide? And, and the concern around that is that you're not actually being your, yourself. And there's a big drive at the moment, especially for the last 12 months from HR teams globally. I hear it at every conference I present at. You need to allow your people to bring their whole self to work. And it's the same way that we interact on social media. So what if you're sitting on a Monday night, you should have seen me on Monday night after my laptop crashed and it had to be reformatted. I had a glass of wine this big, okay? <laughs> I wasn't scared to share that because it had been a shocker of a Monday. I'm a person. On the weekends, you're probably gonna find me with family. You're probably gonna see me with my parents. I'm probably at a brow with friends. What is so wrong with that? I'm showing my values. How many companies wanna hire people that have good family values? So I don't believe that there's, so there's anything that we do that is so bad that we cannot show on social media that actually will enhance any application that we put in there or will endear people to you. As you open that door yourself and you let people in with what you're comfortable with letting people in, they're going to open the door. And I'll tell you what, life going forward is all about, and I know Paul is touching on this because she's the guru in this space, it's all about forming solid relationships. I especially love your reference there to the fact that now um, the way that we're working now, people are getting an insight into your life. You can only have a blurred background for so long, mm -hmm. um, you know, so people are getting an insight into your life. My second question, Van, was just around, um, you know, with with the transition to this online and a lot of, of people might have a similar question is, how do you convey your authenticity and your your confidence in this environment, you know? So obviously you and I know each other, we have a good rapport, it's much easier to have this bond. And, you know, um, if you're meeting somebody for the first time, for example, perhaps through a job interview, um, and it is, you know, it's very difficult to convey authenticity um, on a Teams call, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not quite the same as meeting someone at a reception and having, that chit chat as you walk through to um, the boardroom and go get coffee together, et cetera. So how do you, how do you bridge that gap? Well, you know what? I totally get what you're saying. I, I really and truly do. But my answer is quite simplistic in that it shouldn't be any different. You know, we pick up signals from people when we talk to people. So we're still making eye contact. We're still smiling a lot. We're still using humor. Um, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about something, you, um, you know, just give me, give me a minute. I just want to think about the best answer here. I think that the easiest thing is just to be yourself. Don't try and be someone you're not because you're not going to keep up that facade for a half an hour or an hour's yeah. interview at all. So, my advice would be is that your personality is going to come through. That personality is either going to be a culture fit for that organization or it's not. And I'm telling you now, you can pick it up. So I've been training people now for 12 months and I will always have a better connection with some people on my training because I can see that they're involved. They're asking questions, you know, all of those kind of things. And that is how you stand out on these kind of a, a situation. I, you know, you, you basically... Not that you're going to be the beer to beer in the room, because my God, I always have a beer to beer in my training as well. But you, you always are, you're giving back, you, you know, you're showing an interest, you're keeping your video on is a, is a big thing in online meetings. Um, so that there, there are ways around it. And I don't know, just just be yourself. Like, I'm hopefully, you know, as you said, when you introed me, like, you know, the energy and the positivity is coming through. And I hope that everyone's kind of getting that because I just feel like I'm radiating right now. <laughs> you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody else have any questions for Van? I see somebody's got their hand up. Sorry, Karika. Yes, a uh, quick question. How do I write a good bio? Karika, you know what? What LinkedIn did last year. No, I call year, you. What, what, <laughs> No, yeah, you could call me if you want to if you want to call me. But listen, it's super simple. You don't actually need to call me. So what LinkedIn did last year was they actually extended the number of characters of what you can put in your bio and on LinkedIn. Um, so let's talk focus on LinkedIn for now. 
So you've got something, I think it's like 260 characters. Please just don't tell me what your job title is because you're more than just the person who goes to work from eight till five. So say, for example, Karika, I think you're in the tech space. Um, so you're a um, software developer specializing in the um, the data space, um, passionate about um, helping people to understand businesses better through their data, something like that. So please just don't put your job title there. And then all I recommend that you do across your other platforms is that, say for on Facebook, you also put there that, you know, you in the data space. I mean, even on Facebook now, it's amazing. People are putting down their job titles, where they work, names of companies. And I recommend that because, you know, it's Facebook is a very powerful tool. It's way bigger than um, LinkedIn. Um, from networking perspective, and there's loads of recruitment if you are in the market from an international perspective that happens on a platform like that. So just, Karika, to answer your question, just make it interesting and throw in something more than just your job title if you even put your job title in there at all. You're welcome to go and have a look at mine. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks, Van. Do we have any other questions? You do have um, Vanessa's contact details. Please connect with her on LinkedIn. Um, as, as she did mention, she's got a very active um, profile on LinkedIn, so always very insightful. Go and connect there. But otherwise, if you don't have any questions, thanks, Van. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. And I really That's hope that we can do this in person again. That would be wonderful. Please. Please. <laughs> Bring on the vaccine. Please. <laughs> Excellent. Well, listen, thanks so much, ladies. Thank you for having me. Nor, thanks for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come on and share. Paula, pleasure. over to you. Awesome. <laughs> yes. So, ladies, our next speaker, um, just, yeah, um, I don't want to say too much because she, the core of, of her introduction is Paula. So, herself, her personality, just her appearance when you see her, if you haven't met her in person, um, you'll definitely get that feeling. Um, probably one of the more serene people that I've ever, ever engaged with. And Paula has, um, we've been trying to just tie up the perfect wit session for her. And fortunately, um, it was this one, kicking off the year. And when she presented um, her, her topics to me and um, what, our, what was the focus of today, I, just looking at what she presented and what everybody is going through and what I'm experiencing, I thought, you know, it has to be something people oriented and um, so much has changed so quickly. Um, one of the core things to all of us is our relationships and um, your known relationships and your future relationships. And this is what Paula does. Um, I'm going to share her website, her website link shortly. I'm not going to share it now because I don't want to distract you. She's got one of the most interesting websites. It's a little bit of a rabbit hole. Um, once you click on and read about Paula, Paula's story, where she comes from, it, it's very easy to just um, spend a, a very long time on her website. Um, so I'm do not going to share the link yet, but I'm sure she'll share it at the end. Um, but Paula, thank you very much for putting your hand up and taking the mantle today to, to be our keynote speaker for our first um, kickoff WIT event. And I'm just going to hand it straight over to you. Thanks so much, um, Lauren. And sure, Van, that's definitely some big shoes to follow in terms of your presentation. So thanks for that. <laughs> Can everybody see, just see my slides? I just want to double check because I'm also a Zoomer like Van. Yes, um, we can see it, Paula. Perfect. So just before we start, um, just if you can just type in the chat box, um, when you hear the word relationship, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you? And maybe Lauren, you can just kind of help with that in terms of just reading out some of the, the comments that are coming up. Okay. Uh, so we've got warmth, my husband, my son, value, link with others, between two or more people, family, trust, interaction between two people or more, family, connection, marriage, connection, trust, trust, connection, bonds, connection, uh, people I know, compromise, happiness, a big smiley face, happiness and bond, 
and that which exists between people or groups of people. Fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about relationships and I like to refer to relationships as the currency of the future and Vance touched on it a little bit, but I want to go into a little bit of more depth and that in fact, our whole world thrives on relationships. Our whole world is made of relationships. In fact, we start off our life in a relationship. Our parents are in a relationship and we get conceived in a relationship. We are then, and for those women on the, here that have, that have been pregnant and have ch had children, we are then in a relationship while we are in the womb with mom. And then we get born into a relationship, which is that of mom and dad, our primary caregivers. And if you weren't the lucky one to be the firstborn, you are then in relationship with your siblings and then your immediate family, so grannies and grandpas, and then extended families, aunties and uncles and cousins. And then as you grow up and develop, and you go into school and high school and university, it's relationship with friends and teachers and lecturers. And then as you go into the work workplace, it's about relationships in the workplace with colleagues and um, customers and suppliers. So our whole world revolves around relationships. And I'm going to be touching on this throughout um, the rest of today, but I want to talk about the seven key relationships that play a key role throughout our lifetime. Depending on where we are at, what life stage we're at, each one will shift and take a different level of priority or focus. The first relationship, and these are in no order of, of priority, but I'm just going to list them. The first one is relationship with self. So how I speak to myself, how I think about myself, how I treat myself lays the foundation for how others will interact and engage and have a relationship with me. Then there's relationship with my partner, which is a source of support and nurturing and care and love. And then there's relationships with family being my immediate family, children, if I have my own children or my immediate family or my extended family in terms of in-laws or outlaws, if you want to call them that, depending on what your relationship is with them. Then we have relationships with friends who provide another source of support and nurturing um, and, and place for us to, to be with. Then it is relationships with our peers, so in the workplace. Then it's our spiritual relationship, whatever that is for you, because for some people, spiritual is religion. For others, it is some form of faith. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's going to the beach or maybe for like Van, it's going to the bush. It's whatever feeds your soul and helps to keep you grounded. And then the last relationship is relationship with money. Now, many of us don't think about that as a relationship because of how we are conditioned when we grow up. Um, majority of us often hear money is the root of all evil. Um, you know, money should be saved for a rainy day. Money doesn't grow on trees, all those kind of things. And it's really around how we relate. So relationship is really simply relate. How I relate, which is react or respond to that relationship in my life and who, presently that I am engaging with. So relationship with self, relationship in my personal space or relationship in my workplace. So as you can see, our whole world consists of relationships. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about across all of those relationships. But as we all know, we're a year down the line. It is not the new normal, but we all know that our reality is we've all been impacted and we've all been going through numerous emotional roller coasters in terms of COVID. And in fact, these stats are even outdated because these were from SADC and in terms of what um, people were experiencing from an emotional perspective. And why this is important is because it obviously talks to our relationship with self but it also plays out in terms of how we show up in our other relationships. Um, and our needs and our expectations have changed. So first of all, uh, from a employee perspective, employees are looking for meaning or purpose or as at an individual level. They are looking for safety, so stability in terms of obviously job security, um, salaries and not having to experience salary cuts. Um, knowing that they're going to be safe from a COVID point of view. And we're obviously looking for a sense of belonging. And because we're not going to the workplace, or many of us are still working from home, 
part of us have felt that that sense of belonging has been taken away from us. And that's what our relationships give us. It's a sense of belonging. So, for example, in our personal relationship, we, we belong in a relationship in terms of our romantic relationship with our partner and our children and our family, our tribe. It gives us a sense of belonging, safety, security, nurturing. While at the same time, businesses needs and expectations have changed, particularly in the uncertain and volatile environment, which is they're looking for growth and finding opportunities for growth whilst at the same time trying to find stability and keeping businesses afloat and if they're lucky trying to make some kind of profit so we've had to manage our own needs and our own expectations from our personal relationship and personal perspective and that of our partners and our children and our families and our friends and we've had to manage relationships in the business world when it comes to needs and expectations either as an employee as a leader or and or as a business owner, depending on what environment you find yourself in. We've had to adapt or die. And I don't mean die from a COVID point of view. I mean, literally, we've had to adapt and we've had to really get to grips with technology. So uh, like Van, I've had to get to grips with also, I had my laptop crashed, it was in November last year. But we've just had to get more tech, tech savvy in terms of being online. So learning how to do Zoom, Microsoft, um, teams, um, you know, being in chat groups, networks, online seminars, conferences, etc. We've had to upskill ourselves very quickly from a tech perspective. And so we've had to reinvent ourselves um, at an individual level, but we've also had to build and grow relationships globally, but in a digital world. And that's been very hard for some people to do because we lose so much online than what we would in a face-to-face -face environment. And a lot of people are missing that human connection, that human interaction, and we've been touch starved. And there's actually a lot of research that's been done around how even the simplest handshake from a stranger, that skin-to-skin -skin contact, can do so much to uplift our mood and our psyche and our well-being because we are social creatures by nature. And we've all heard it around the digital fatigue and all of these things and, you know, how we are, you know, we we're, we're, um, just can't cope with being online anymore. And there's a lot of truth to that. We need that human interaction. And some of the research um, that has been done worldwide, and in fact, this was around before COVID was around. It was another pandemic, but people weren't talking about it until COVID hit. And that was the pandemic of chronic loneliness. And the research that they've done from a human psyche point of view, that chronic loneliness, the impact that it has on our um, mental health and well-being is the equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, which makes it more um, serious than obesity. So, yeah, that just tells us how important it is to reach out and build those relationships, um, whether it's in our personal spaces or whether it's in the workspace. But a lot of us have also found ourselves functioning on autopilots, where we are just going through the motions. And this is where mental health is becoming topical at the moment. And I'm sure you've all attended a lot of seminars and webinars on mental health and well-being. But because of how we are coping and what some of the negative um, coping mechanisms we've put in place, and it makes complete sense, and I understand it, I don't necessarily agree with it, why they've put the alcohol ban in place, um, from a mental health perspective, um, because unfortunately, gender-based violence is one of those things that is now coming up very much more um, in recent, in the last sort of four months, because the further we go down into lockdown, relationships are being impacted, particularly in the home environment, and we are getting more and more stats around the world where domestic abuse or gender-based violence is becoming a lot more evident. So what do I mean by functioning on autopilot? Well, we don't really connect with what is going on inside of us in terms of relationship with self. We either are mad, glad, sad, or stressed. Now, if you've ever said to someone, oh, I'm feeling so stressed, that's great. But have you ever stopped to think and reflect, what does that really mean when I say I'm stressed? Or when your partner or your friend or your colleague says I'm stressed? as to what is really going on underneath that word stress, because we often throw it around like a blanket or a coat. And so uh, a lot of the times we will be flitting between the column on the left, which is when we are in a positive space and a positive frame of mind and a positive emotional state, 
or we will be in the middle, which is when we are in a negative emotional state or a negative frame of mind and we are not coping. And in extreme cases, we go to the column on the right and that's when we start hitting um, clinical diagnosis and disorders and stuff like that. So a lot of people have been on this emotional roller coaster a ride, flitting between the two, but we haven't really checked in with self, relationship with self in terms of what is really going on underneath. What am I feeling? And how people are being impacted from a relationship with self perspective is obviously mood swings, irritability, and some of the coping mechanisms that we're seeing coming out is things like snacking more than usual, particularly working at home. It's far easier to get up and go to the cupboard and the fridge and um, you know snack um, to cope or to avoid coping with what's really going on. Fatigue, irritability, snapping at our partners, snapping at our kids, snapping at our colleagues, whatever it might be, um, because we're not checking in with self. We're not in tune with where am I at in my head and where am I at in my body in terms of my emotions. And how this affects us is how am I showing up and how am I co-creating my relationships personally and or professionally? Am I in a positive frame of mind or a negative frame of mind? Am I in a positive emotional space or a negative emotional space? And as Vanessa alluded to earlier on, how she takes the negatives and reframes them into a positive. And that's one of the, the three critical skills that we're going to need to get us through this year is, looking, is, is building resilience. And one of the ways of doing that is turning negatives into positives or seeing the positive or coming out with a positive frame of mind or, or reflection. So in terms of self, it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to tell our partners and our children and our friends and our colleagues that it's okay to not be okay. This is where the human side starts coming in. And Vanessa alluded to it earlier on, where we are becoming more human. We are showing more of our real selves and it's okay to show that. Um, you know, we don't have to put on this big brave bravado and that I'm okay and I've got this perfect life because I've got it all together because we don't. We're all human, we all make mistakes, we all have bad days, and it's a natural part of life, it's a natural part of who we are, and it's a natural part of relationships. Conflict is a natural part of a relationship, personally or professionally. But we don't like conflict because it feels awkward, so we tend to avoid conflict and confrontation. We hide away from it, or we come out and we attack. Attack can be done in various different ways, but the common ways is naming, shaming, blaming, judging, um, labeling, criticizing, fault finding. And we do it in our personal relationships with our partners, we do it with our kids, we do it with our family members because they're getting on our nerves and we do it in the workplace as well. So conflict is actually growth trying to happen. Conflict really just tells us that we're being challenged on a level that makes us feel uncomfortable and awkward, which is why we try to avoid it and we try to resist it. So I want to encourage you that the next time you find yourself in a conflict situation, and when I say conflict, I don't mean a shouting, screaming match, something that makes you feel awkward and uncomfortable. I want to challenge you to embrace conflict, embrace it as an opportunity to grow in terms of learning something about yourself, learning something about the other person or persons, and learning something about the situation. What's really going on underneath the conflict there? Because the more you put yourself in that uncomfortable situation and environment, the easier it will be for you to deal with conflict and face it head on than avoiding it. And the red flags that we often don't pay attention to because we, a lot of the time we live in our heads, we overthink things, we overanalyze, we um, try to justify, we try to sell ourselves on why something is the way it is or why somebody reacted the way they did or why a situation is the way it is, instead of really checking in and, and looking at the red flags. So, for example, feeling anxious, feeling irritable, um, feeling um, moody, feeling down, feeling depressed. Where are you feeling it in your body? Where are you feeling it? Is it in your stomach? Is it in your neck? Is it in your, um, are you tensioning your jaws? Are you not sleeping properly? Are you not eating properly? Um, those kind of things. Pay attention to relationship with self, but then at the same time, how are you impacting those relationships around you about how you are showing up? Or how are you allowing other people to impact you by how they are showing up? So how are you co-creating that relationship space? 
And the relationship space is simply the space between two people. That is where your relationship lives and how you both show up is how you both co-create that relationship space. And if that relationship space does not feel safe, conflict will arise. So, so think of communication. Communication equals connection. If there is no safe connection, communication will not take place on a very real level or a deep level or an authentic level. It will happen at a superficial level. And when that happens, then conflict can arise. And conflict can show up in one of two ways. We will either shut down and withdraw from the relationship to avoid conflict and confrontation, or we will attack. In other words, we will come out fighting and we will be confrontational. So pay attention to the red flags in your relationships. And this goes to your spiritual relationship as well. Um, if something feels out of sync, if, you not, if you're feeling empty, if you're feeling numb, if you're feeling um, like something is not feeding your soul, like you're questioning your purpose in life, or if it's um, money is scarce. So we always talk joke about the, the end of the month, the salty cracks moments or the salty cracks times. When relationship, when when money is scarce, um, how how do we cling or, or hold on to it? And I always challenge people to think of relation of money as a if you had a, if you were in a romantic relationship with money, how would you treat money? How would you show it respect? How would you nurture it? How would you be kind to it? How would you embrace it? And how would you give it freedom to move? So money is like energy. It comes and goes, it ebbs and flows. Think beginning of the month, end of the month. It's the same with emotions. Our emotions is energy. It comes and goes, it ebbs and flows, depending on what's happening in our space and how we are showing up for it and reacting. And it's the same with our relationships, personally and professionally. So it really is around how are you showing up and co-creating those relationships. So when you're fighting with your children, or you're fighting with your partner, always go back to self and say, how am I co-creating this space? Am I allowing, because my partner happened to wake up on the wrong side of the bed and they're in a bad mood, have I allowed them to put me in a bad mood? And how did I react and respond to that that's co-created the situation? Because it always comes back to self and it always takes two people to co-create a relationship space. And that's where communication is key, the power of communication. So whether you are online in social media, like Vanessa was speaking about, what are you putting out there? What is it saying about you as an individual, as your personal brand? Or how are you communicating with your partner? Are you doing it in a loving way, nurturing way, caring way, respectful way? Or, and that applies to your children, your family, and your friends, and your team and your colleagues as well. Um, whether it's in a team environment, whether it is in a one-on-one -on -one environment because communication equals connection. And that co-creates the relationship space between you, where there is trust, where there is respect, where there is honesty. And if you don't have those in place, it's very difficult for real authentic communication to take place. Sometimes we may need to set boundaries and boundaries in all of those areas, relationship with self. So. Think about how you speak to yourself, how you treat yourself, how you show up for yourself. Ask yourself the question, if I was my own best friend, would I be treating my best friend this way? And the answer is probably not. So why do you do it to yourself then? Perhaps you need to put a boundary down and stop that negative self-talk or stop running yourself down, stop criticizing yourself and accepting yourself flaws and all because we're all human and we all make mistakes. Where do you pretend you need to put boundaries down when it comes to your, your personal relationship or your romantic relationship with your partner? Perhaps you need to put a boundary down for some self, for some me time and some time out. Perhaps you need to put a boundary down in terms of behavior or the way you speak to each other or treat each other, particularly when you're, when you're having an argument. Um, how do you need to put down boundaries when it comes to parenting and children in terms of boundaries with your kids? And let's be honest, kids are there to challenge us. They're there to help us grow and they will test the boundaries just like we did when we were children and we were growing up and we tested our parents' um, boundaries that they set for us. Family members, um, one of the common things that comes up with the work that I do when it comes to, to couples and, and, and relationships in the personal space 
is interfering or meddling family members, whether it's mother-in-law, whether it's sister-in-law, or whether it's a friend that is too close for comfort, how do you need to protect your relationship by putting boundaries down for external influences to come into your space? Um, friendships. It's around, um, I'm not sure if you've heard the, the sum, but we become the collective sum of the five people that we spend most of our time with. And that becomes our circle of influence. And the easiest way to see this is if you have teenagers or if you've seen a group of teenagers, they all um, start blending together in terms of they dress alike, they speak alike, they laugh at the same thing, they finish each other's sentences, um, they use the same slang words, etc. Because they are much more easily influenced at that young age because they haven't yet formed their own sense of identity and self. And it's the same with us in our personal world and in the workplace. Who we surround ourselves with becomes our circle of influence. And so how are you influencing those people and how are they influencing you in terms of the collective sum? And perhaps if there are any negative influences or toxic relationships or relationships that no longer align with your values and or your personal brand that you're trying to build, perhaps you need to put a boundary down there. And then in terms of the relationship with the workplace, um, right now a lot of people are struggling with boundaries because it is interfering with our um, work-life balance because the home has now become the workplace and we are now seeing into people's intimate spaces. As Van was talking earlier, we see people's children and spouses and cats and dogs and everything. We're seeing into our personal space. And the lines have become blurred with work-home life balance, or as I like to call it, work-life integration, because everybody's version of balance is different. So what does your balance look like and where do you potentially need to put boundaries down? And some of the, the corporates that I'm working with, for example, the one corporate they've made Wednesday as a no meeting day in terms of no online digital meetings. It's a boundary that they've put down to give staff some time out in terms of just being on online and digital fatigue. And they also on the weekends encourage their staff to not log on to work and to rather actually have quality time with family and friends and or at home and me time just so that they can um, have, have a digital detox. Failure is a big thing, and I want to tell you all that failure is an event, it is not a person. If something happens to you, like a you've gone through a divorce, um, you've got retrenched, you lost your job, you took a salary cut, or whatever it is, it is an event, it is not you the person. You are not a failure, okay? But often we take it on board personally, and we see ourselves as a failure. There's no such thing as failure, it is only feedback. Um, feedback as to something you did or didn't do, and because and you didn't get the result that you were looking for, or it was an event of circumstances that were beyond your control and there's nothing that you can do about it. So remind yourself that from a, from a relationship point of view, whether it's in your personal space or whether it's in the workspace, that it is not a reflection of you as a person. Failure is an event. It's something that happened or happens, and how do we move on from that? And especially with women, we're very good at the guilt, carrying the guilt bag with us. And we carry it in our personal spaces because this perception of we have to be the perfect wife, perfect life, perfect career, perfect mother, perfect everything. And we take care of everybody else's needs and we put our own needs last. And then we feel guilty because we're not managing or we're not coping or we're not um, having, you know, we haven't got it all together. And so I want to encourage you ladies to, to ditch the guilt. Um, you don't need to carry guilt around you. It's absolutely unnecessary. It just puts more stress and strain. And this is a little formula that I share in terms of how you can ditch the guilt. And it really is that broken record that we play over and over again in our minds around the should have, would have, could have. I should have done this. I, should, I would have done this. I could have done this. All of those kind of things. And all you're doing is looping that record over and over again and you're just torturing yourself and adding to your stress and your anxiety. So I wanna encourage you to ditch the guilt, okay? You're human, we all make mistakes, and there's no need to add to your stress and your worries with just trying to get through managing day-to-day -day life. You don't need to add to that. We also need to look at redefining success when it comes to our, our world and our personal perspectives and what that looks like in our personal space and what it looks like in, the, in our professional space. 
a lot of people get stuck in the comparison or analysis paralysis. We compare our relationships to other people and we go, oh, look at them. They've got such a perfect relationship. They're such a perfect couple. They look at them. Look how amazing they are. They're a power couple. And that may be great on the outside, but you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. And I see a lot of the time where people put on this big, brave, bravado facade of how wonderful we are, but behind closed doors, they're living a very volatile relationship which impacts kids and it creates a unsafe emotional foundation for kids and it just carries on, on with those kids that are carried into their adult relationships and it's a repetitive cycle that plays out. Um, and then again, in, in terms of the lifestyle that we live, we, we so often are striving for the, the house we live in, the car we drive, the job title, the the, the corner office that we used to have it's now the third bedroom in our households that we have and it's what, what does success look like for you because everybody's picture of success is different and this has been turned on its head with COVID because we've had to relook really at what is important versus what is valuable and for me what came out for me in this is I've realized that for me things that are important is freedom of movement independence family and relationships and being able to have quality work-life balance as opposed to what was I, I thought was valuable which was all the material things i've realized that we could do without so much stuff and that, that we collected so much stuff and i did a big clean out in december and i did about eight to ten big black dustbin bags and i got the um, hospice shop to come in and clean it out so we've really had done a, a big reset and a lot of us have questioned now in terms of going forward and what does success and quality of life and balance look like for us and if you've got these things going for you you're a lot richer for it and a lot more successful for it for having these things in place and so what are the healthy foundations when it comes to relationships and this can be applied personally and professionally because it applies across both worlds if you have trust if you have respect respect first and foremost at a human being level because that's what we are before anything else before you bring in gender age skills qualifications race whatever it might be but just respect each other at a human being level the ability to resolve conflict the ability to communicate and the ability to co-create psychological safety and physical safety and that talks to the relational space or the relationship space that i was mentioning earlier the space between two people there's actually very little difference between personal relationships and professional relationships. The key difference is love. Our personal relationships are much more emotionally charged because they're driven by a romantic love with our partners and an unconditional love with our children versus love in the workplace, which is love for the organization we work for or the brand, my job role and function, the people I work with or the industry or the sector that I'm in. So love actually is one of the key differentiating factors because we love in different ways. So I want to give you three little tips and tools that you can take back with you to help you build better relationships in the workplace and at home. This is a little formula. I'm sure you've all heard of the uh, VUCA, which stands for volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And you can use this as for your teams and you can use this around the dinner table with your family and even with your friends if you want. So the V stands for venting. So let's use it from a team perspective. If you're having a team meeting, get them to um, vent. So, so each person gets a minute or two minutes, depending on how big your team is, to really vent and offload. Whatever it is that they want to offload on. It can be something personal. It can be something in the workplace. It can be something about their dog, their parents, their whatever, the, the, the guy standing at the robot. It doesn't matter. But let them vent and offload. And then get get them to give an update on where they're at in terms of either their projects that they're working on, the tasks that they're working on, deliverables, whatever it might be. And if you happen to be a leader and, and with your, working with a team, what this does is it gives you insights, not only as a leader, but as a team and how to support each other from a team, is how to be there for that person by understanding, first of all, what they're going through, which is what they're venting about, and potentially where they may need help in terms of updating on the, the, the tasks or their status. So it creates a place of safety, it creates a psychological safety, it creates emotional safety, it creates a trusted space and it builds rapport from a team perspective and a group perspective. 
it enables you to connect with each other on different levels. And then to ask um, where they may need help. Each person can put their hand up and say, I need help with this, or I need help with that. And then this is where you can create buddy systems if you've got quite a big team and how to look out for each other and how to connect with each other on a deeper level. And it creates trust and it creates safety and honesty and respect. So that's how you can use this. And you can use the same process at the dinner table with either your, your partner and if you've got kids, you can teach it to your kids as a way for them to learn how to process and deal their emotion, with their emotions and also how to express themselves and talk about their emotions, which will stand them in good stead when they get into adulthood in terms of their own personal relationships one day when they're in a relationship, but also on how to create healthy safety, emotional, psychological safety and relationships in the workplace as well. So that's a little formula, little tool that you can use. And then three ways to really connect on a much deeper level um, is these three little sentences that you can ask. And this is where it helps you as an individual develop um, emotional intelligence, but it helps you build and connect and build rapport on a deeper level. So, and it also helps from a conflict management point of view in terms of just reacting and responding. So for example, if um, let's say this is your, your partner has said something to you, so instead of responding, what do you mean about that? Or um, what are you trying to say? You can use the sentence to say, well, tell me more about that. Or help me understand what you mean when you say this. And what this does is it invites the person to go to that next deeper level and check within themselves, reconnect to their relationship with self and understand, okay, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling irritable, What that? what's really coming up for me is, you know what, it's actually not about you, I'm just taking it out on you, but it was actually something that happened at work that I've brought home. And so it gets the conversation going. And you can then go to that next level, which is, is there, is there anything more you'd like to share about this? And I can promise you there's always more that comes up. Because when you start creating an emotionally safe space, people feel safer to open up and let you in and connect and share with you. And you can also use this in the workplace as well, okay? It works e equally well in the workplace too. Um, and even with friends or family members too. So this is another little way that you can, or another little tool that you can use to help you connect um, on a deeper level, on a more human level. Because you either have a positive or a negative impact on the world, there is no in between. So it's how are you showing up and how are you co-creating the relationships? Because I'm sorry to say, and I say this respectfully, because I know a lot of people disagree, um, but money does not make the world go round. Relationships do. And how are you creating your relationships? What is the quality of your relationships? What is the health of your relationships, both personally and professionally? So a little bit about me, for those of you that don't know me, and thanks to, to Van for actually introducing me to this group and Lauren for the opportunity to chat. Um, my name is Paula Quincy. I got into this work in 2006 through my own personal journey. I was in a six and a half year relationship that had hit rock bottom. We were going for counseling and our, therapy, uh, our therapist referred us to Imago Relationship Therapy. And so we went off to save our relationship and I was exposed to Imago Relationship Therapy. And I was just, I was just overwhelmed by the impact that it had on me and helping me understand how my upbringing had shaped and influenced who I had become my perspective on the world and how I was forging relationships both personally and profession professionally. And there and then I decided that I wanted to learn this stuff because life is too short to be miserable and unhappy, especially in our relationships, which, is, which should be our biggest source of nurturing and, and care. And so I then got um, trained up on it and I've started doing this work initially part time because in that back in those days in my previous lifetime, as I like to call it, I was in the corporate world. I, I worked for um, Standard Bank, Ned Bank and KFC. And I was doing this in, in the spare time, in my spare time capacity in the evenings and the weekends, facilitating workshops. And then eventually in 2014, an opportunity came up to leave corporate and go into this work full time. So I've been doing it full time since then. And I, I like to say that I play in both spaces. I play in terms of working with individuals in their personal capacity 
where I, I run programs for men and women around personal growth and development, and I work with couples from personal relationships and family dynamics. And then I work in the, I play in the corporate space around relationship dynamics in the workplace, so things like conflict management, communication, team dynamics, personal growth and development, emotional intelligence, and also behavioral profiling, so in other words, psychometric assessments around behavior and energy and emotional levels. Um, I've been very blessed in my journey. I've, I've written two books. The first one was Embracing Conflict, which is um, quite a bit of what I've touched on today. And then my second book, Embracing No, is around how to say no and be okay with it and not feel guilty. Um, a lot of the time, we, we find it difficult to put down boundaries and say no. And, and again, I generalize when I say woman, but generally women struggle to say no and put down boundaries because of our nurturing instinct and because we want to take care of others and, and be there for others. And we find it hard to put on boundaries. But I want to say to you that when you say yes to everything else and everyone else, you are saying no to you. You're saying that your needs don't matter and you're not important. But when you say no to other people and other things, you're saying yes to you. You're saying, yes, I'm important. And yes, my needs matter too. And I'm equally a priority like everyone else in my life and in my world. And yeah, I've been very blessed to, to work globally and, and speak globally as well. I've also done a, a TED talk. And um, in terms of who am I personally when I'm not in the working world, um, I, my passion is running. I'm a long distance runner. I've been very blessed to, to run Comrades and um, Two Oceans and, and marathons and that. It's my happy place or what I like to call my place where I go to meditate and, and de-stress but also socialize. And um, I have a 26-year-old stepdaughter who's just come back from teaching um, English in Vietnam last year. And yeah, my hubby is in the solar business and he helps people in terms of residential um, Keep, keep their lights on, so to speak. So that's a little bit about me and my contact details. And um, I have a lot of free resources on my website if anybody would, is, is looking or interested for those kind of things. But I'm also happy to take any sort of questions or, or answer any, um, yeah, any questions that anybody has. And I hope that's helped you with some tips in terms of the, the various relationships in our lives and perhaps give you some insights into what's going on in your life at the moment, depending on where you're at. Paula, amazing. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you can see the comments, but they're just lighting up. I have shared your website and I also just quickly found your TED Talk and shared it as well. I have watched it and it's on my like list. Um, amazing. I've made so many notes. I think what you've touched on is just truly, truly insightful. Um, our relationships, if anything has come out of the last year, it has highlighted our relationships. So the information you shared today has been invaluable. Um, sorry, did you press the wrong button there? <laughs> um, I just said the information you shared today has just been invaluable. Um, I think after the year that we've all had where it has been a tremendous opportunity to focus internally, to focus on what matters close to us and perhaps um, in some in instances, people have been afforded the opportunity to release toxic circumstances, to remove themselves. And in other situations, they might have found themselves trapped and um, looking for a purpose, for a way, for a path. And I think you've just really shared on both, both sides of that coin amazing insight. So thank you very much. I have one question for you, and um, it was just a little bit about your, you mentioned resilience, and resilience is such a buzzword, um, and especially um, now, you know, there's there's a lot about resilience and bouncing back. Um, in your experience or in your guidance, how do you, what is something that people can do to, to work on their own resilience? You're on, oh, there we go. Just so you know, your background keeps changing, Paula. Um, let me see if I can... I think it was just the lighting. Oh, there we go. Yeah, perfect. Cool. Yeah, you, know, you know, resilience, people think that to be resilient, you have to do this huge, big, you know, uh, daily mantra, daily, you know, this, this 
big thing, but resilience is really, it's really about the ability to first of all, manage your own emotions in the situation. So how are you responding or reacting? And um, I like to use the, the kind of, I use the word fear because often resilience underpinning that is fear, okay? Fear of the unknown, fear of potential outcomes, fear of um, what are people going to say, what are people going to think, et cetera, et cetera. So I like to use the FEAR acronym. So the F stands for facts. Right now, what are the facts? Because often we are so focusing on everything out there that's outside of our control instead of what's in, in our control. So what are the facts right now? And, and let me just work with those facts because that's all I can work with because that's what's known to me instead of trying to worry about what's outside of my control. Then the E stands for emotion. Right now, what are the emotions that I am experiencing? Okay, I'm scared. Okay, I'm overwhelmed. Okay, I'm stressed. Okay, I'm this. There's that saying that when you name it, you can tame it. So when I name my emotion, I can start processing it. I can start working through it. Um, and it makes it more real to acknowledge what I'm feeling and what's going on inside of me. It makes it okay. And then the A stands for action. What's one action, just one action that I can take right now with the facts that I have available, understanding the emotions that I'm experiencing to just move me one step forward. And once I've moved one step forward, what is my new reality, which is the R in fear? Because when you've shifted one step, there is new facts that become available or evident, perhaps new emotions that are now coming up. And then what can I take in terms of a new action or a new step? And often it's this fear that keeps people stuck in this, should I, shouldn't I? I don't know what to do. I'm a, and it's just using that formula over and over to process and work through the unknown, which is where resilience comes in. It's being comfortable with the unknown. I don't know if I love that, that. I love that acronym. I think it's something, a real takeaway that you can really just put into practice. Um, ladies, let's open it up. Um, does anybody want to ask Paula anything or even just type a question in the comments while we have her undivided attention? This is possibly a topic that um, is, uh, what was the last word? Um, it was your new reality, next R is for reality. Well, you've all got Paula's contact details and I really encourage you to connect with her also on LinkedIn and follow her on LinkedIn. And Paula, thank you very much. As I, as I said, I really think it was a relevant topic, a fantastic way to kick off the year. And I think you've given the ladies um, really a lot of information and tools that they can put into practice. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, and thank you, ladies, for having me as your guest. And thanks, Van. We finally got to share the stage together. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> thanks, Van. That was, that, was, that was brilliant. I love recommending people who come on and present and are like flipping rock stars. So, Paula, you owned it. Well done, buddy. Thanks, Fantastic. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, ladies. Really, just another wonderful event. It just makes my heart so happy to EC all of you. Um, it's uh, fantastic. And um, we have another event lined up soon. And again, I encourage you, if you would like to um, speak at any of these uh, virtual events, or if you'd like to host a virtual event, please reach out to me. Um, but otherwise, have a fantastic evening. And it's the month of love. And remember, that's not just outside. It's also self-love. So treat yourself. Go buy yourself chockies. Go buy yourself some wine and champagne. The bottle stores are open at 10 tomorrow. Um, but really, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to Vanessa and Paula. And have a great evening. And I'll chat to you all soon. Cheers, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you.